The following half-hour show is a paid political program and is not endorsed by this station, management, or staff. The following program is sponsored by Excalibur Insurance Management Services. We welcome back to this week's show the current President Judge of the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, Judge Kevin Brobson. Judge Brobson is the Republican nominee currently for the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. That race is on the ballot this coming Tuesday. Judge Brobson is the son of a Pennsylvania State Trooper. He received his undergraduate degree from Lycoming College, magnum cum laude. He then went on to law school at the Wider University School of Law and graduated with his Juris Doctorate, summa cum laude, finishing second in his graduating class. Upon graduation, he clerked for the Honorable James Magger Kelly, a federal judge for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. After his clerkship, he joined one of the state's largest and most prestigious law firms, Buchanan, Ingersoll & Rooney, based in Pittsburgh. He received the distinction of being rated among the best lawyers in America in 2009. Also in 2009, Kevin ran for and won statewide election for a seat on the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, later becoming its president judge. The Commonwealth Court is the forum that affects most Pennsylvanians because its jurisdiction includes how we educate our children, elect our public officials, preserve our historic and natural resources, as well as cases by citizens that challenge the actions of state or local government. It is this experience that Judge Brobson has that he believes recommends him to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. On today's show, Judge Brobson defends his record since he has become the target of scurrilous attack ads from left-wing progressive PACs that favor his opponent. This is the Volpe Report, a weekly news and political interview show examining the latest local, state, and national issues with Chuck Volpe. Insightful informative, controversial, the area's premier political talk show, The Volpe Report. Kevin, welcome to The Volpe Report. Thank Good you for having me. Back. Appreciate it. You're coming off the, uh, as we like to say, the hustings of Pennsylvania as a statewide candidate. Having been there myself, it's a big state. Uh, I remember talking to you about a month and a half ago when you were a guest in this show, when you were kind of just hitting your stride. And well, a month and a half later and only a few days out from the ele from election day, I, I'm sure you've hit your stride and you're at full sprinting to the finish. So how's it going? I think it's going great. We've been received very well throughout the state. Uh, you know, it's we have a wonderful Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, 67 beautiful counties, very different. Uh, we've been uh, putting a lot of miles on the car, talking to a lot of voters, uh, understanding what the voters really want from their judges and their justices. Uh, and what I've really found out is they want judges and justices that will apply the law as written, that will hold government accountable, that will protect their constitutional rights, and that will stand by their decisions when they issue them. That's what I found out. You've been very clear about your opinion, so I'd like you to remind of, of, uh, the voters and viewers uh, of your position on, on the Constitution and the role of the courts in it. Sure. So, uh, you know, one of the one of the things people have said to me or one person in particular has said to me in this race is, is to try to make it sound like this and very straightforward is, you know, the legislature has the first say on what the law is in Pennsylvania. Then the governor sort of has the second say in terms of enforcing it. The last say goes to the courts. You know, the courts are the ones that have the final say on, especially the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, on the constitutionality of laws, the constitutionality of actions by our government officials, uh, protecting our rights. Uh, and, and so when they have the last say, it's very important for the people of Pennsylvania to have faith in, in, in the court and understand that it's not going to be partisan, that it's not going to be political, uh, and that the court is going to be that institution that's going to stand up for them. Um, I know a lot of people have been disappointed by what's happened over the last several years. It's one of the reasons why I've run. In terms of the election cases, I had a front row seat of that in the Commonwealth Court. Of I, issued, I issued several cases, uh, decisions dealing with last year's election, and I was even the trial judge when the, when the challenge was made to the congressional districts right. uh, from, from 2010. So, uh, you know, I, I have witnessed how important these courts are to the people of Pennsylvania, and we get a lot of political type actions in my court, in the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania. So it has always been important for me as a judge when I decide a case uh, to, to provide every party that fairness, every party that understands when they come in that, you know, when they see the awesome side of government on one side, that they know that it doesn't matter, especially it doesn't matter to Judge Brobson. He's going to give me a fair shot. Right. And that's all I've tried to do. And that's what I've campaigned on is here's my record. I have a record of fairness. 
You don't become, you don't get appointed to the Judicial Conduct Board of Pennsylvania. You don't become the chair of that body. You don't become the president judge of a statewide intermediate appellate court by being unfair, by right. being political. And that's my record. That's what I've been running on. That's what I've been presenting to the voters of Pennsylvania for the last, I don't know how many months, yeah. um, but all 67 counties. And I think it has been well received. And I think we're on a path to victory on Tuesday. Sure. Well, uh, you've received the highest possible designation of high rec highly recommended by the Pennsylvania Bar Association, of course, which is congratulations. Uh, a lot of judges that are good quality judges for various intermediate courts are, that are running this time don't, they get recommended, but highly recommended as a special designation that you receive. To me, it boils down uh, as a lawyer for 36 years now, I'm dating myself, but <laughs> a long time. And, and always loving uh, constitutional uh, law and constitutional decisions. It, it really, to me, is the mortar between the bricks that keeps our country together. And uh, it comes down to, 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 to two, two philosophies, and I like to get a little bit more about yours. And I understand I'm using broad strokes right. here, but, but we'll use some broad strokes. Um, effectively, there are two main schools for me. There is the school that believes that the import and intent of our Constitution is as valid today and as, an import, as important today as it was in 1776 in the latter parts of the 18th century. The, the people that wrote it, uh, if you look at the Federalist Papers and some of the comments in the Federalist Papers about what that Constitution and the Declaration of Independence meant, kind of set forth the role of the courts to be the arbiter of, of that Constitution. So, and, and in my view has been, and I'll insert, you know, you know, I'm calling attention, this is my personal editorial opinion, is that that document was brilliantly crafted in a way that allowed for future exigencies and, uh, you know, all men are created equal is, it, it doesn't change, that definition to me doesn't change over time. And, but at any rate, th that's one school, that the document is still a living document that is, is important today and, and meaningful today as it was then. Then you get the other school, which I'll flat out refer to, uh, Judge, as the progressive thought, which is they weren't rules, they're more like guidelines. And the, dodge, the document is malleable and should change, in fact, with the times and facts and circumstances as we move forward. Yeah, one of my favorite movies, I used to take my kids to, and I, all six of them, I think there were six equals, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> and uh, there was that initial scene, if you saw the movie, when uh, uh, the, the woman in the uh, Kiera Knightley's the actress she invokes parlay, parlay. <laughs> yeah. and uh, at one point uh, Captain Barbosa uh, uh, says to her you know basically that by the way they're, they're more like guidelines instead of actual rules well the progressive view of the Constitution and this is important for you as a Supreme Court justice is just that they're more like guidelines to be molded as circumstances and time and cultural changes develop so where do you fit in that spectrum? I, I think it's important for people to know, like, because that says a lot. You can then somewhat predict how rulings will happen in the future. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not a guideline person. Um, you know, I'm I'm a very rule oriented person. I like to follow the rules. Uh, when when I pledge to follow rules, I mean to follow the rules. When I raise my hand to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth. It's not what I think the Constitution should say, uh, it's what it actually does say. Um, I try to stay away from you know, those, uh, those buzzwords, originalist, textualist, but I think anybody that has objectively ruled, looked at my record that uses those terms view me as an originalist and a textualist. My job is not to fill the gaps in the Constitution. My job is not to uh, it is not to, to, to bend with the whims of, of what current society is. Because I believe the documents are fantastic. Mm -hmm. I believe our United States Constitution is a fantastic document. The amendment process to get it amended is exactly what we should have. Mm -hmm. And I believe the same way about the Pennsylvania Constitution. These are time-honored, standing, lasting documents. And if the people of Pennsylvania want them to change, there's a process to change them. We just went through that in May in the primary where we, had, where we amended the Constitution of Pennsylvania. It's possible to do that. That's the way you change the Constitution. We don't really want to look to the courts to alter constitutional rights. We want to look to the courts to protect constitutional rights. And I think anybody that would look at my record, which I invite everybody to do, uh, would see that that's the kind of judge I've been and that's the kind of justice I will be. In a, uh, an opinion recently, uh, I think it was a Sup United States Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote an opinion. And in that opinion, as, as 
you've done a million times, I'm sure, writing opinions, made direct quotes from precedent, from prior courts and prior justices. And in this case, she uh, made reference to the great Thurgood Marshall, uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice. Uh, he had referred to, uh, in a case that he had handled, a, a majority opinion for the court, illegal aliens. He had made the references to illegal aliens. Well, she, in quoting him, not her own interpretation, in quoting him, eliminated illegal aliens and put brackets, non-citizen, because apparently that's not politically correct. And, and I'm like, I'm appalled. Uh, well, first of all, let me make something clear before everybody, you know, you know, the progressives in our audience start screaming. <laughs> Look, illegal alien was from the statute. <laughs> so I think justices are supposed to put exactly the wording, right? If you were quoting a statute in an opinion, you would actually use the wording. You know, like this is the kind, this is what I'm talking about, this ability to now mold and bend, even in U.S. Supreme Court uh, decisions, a politically correct revisionist view. And that's why I say I think it's important for people to know where you stand on that kind of liberal, uh, progressive interpretation, even to the point of changing the language of prior justices. Well, even of, of course, I of course, I have a lot of respect for all of our United States Supreme Court right. justices, right. regardless of their philosophy, sure. and in the same way for the Pennsylvania Supreme Court justices. Um, writing style, uh, I, I, I tend to write more directly. I try to write more directly. My job is really not just to write for the parties that are in front of me, the lawyers that are in front of me, but the people of Pennsylvania who can understand why I rule the way I rule and so they can hold me accountable. Um, that's really the approach that I take to that. But, you know, I, 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 I understand that uh, I am not there to write law. Um, in fact, an attack ad that is pending against me right now in this campaign run by the Democratic Party is taking me to task, uh, accusing me of being a political hack because I applied the words of the statute. The statute was very clear. This was in an election case last year. And I was very clear. The statute said, shall fill out date and sign. And uh, there was a county that was counting undated mail-in ballots. Um, and I said that wasn't, that wasn't right under the statute. Not only wasn't it right, but when it's, a, it's an election that crosses county lines and there's a count, another county that is not counting undated ballots, then you question whether the election is fair to all voters, whether my vote counts should not depend on which county I'm in. Of course. Yeah. It should not depend on what the election officials in that county choose to do and not do. Um, yet, that is an instance where I apply the law as written. Uh, four justices of the seven actually agreed with me that I was right on the law. One just didn't feel that we should apply the law in that election. We should allow those votes to count and, and apply the law going forward. forward. But yet, um, you know, I get attacked for doing my job for applying the law as written. Um, and again, I have had that case come up multiple times during this election. I have actually even talked about it affirmatively. Um, the Philadelphia Inquirer, one of the reasons why they chose not to endorse me in the race is because of that. I am fine. If people don't want to vote for me because I made that ruling, that's my record. I get it. Um, but to call me a political hack for issuing that decision, that's not something I expected to see. Well, it's something in all my time covering politics and, and, and reading about it. Uh, I've never heard that terminology used in a Supreme Court race, statewide race in this state. It's often you, I've been called it many times. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but, but then again, I've run for offices like governor and senator and other issues where everything plus the kitchen sink is pretty much fair game. Well, and it's fair game in a judicial election too. You know, the first thing we do is we go in front of the Pennsylvania Bar Association for a rating. You mentioned my highly recommended rating. One of the questions that they ask us is to cite to five of our most significant decisions. Now, if our decisions weren't relevant to a rating by the Pennsylvania Bar Association, then why would they ask them for us? Of course. And, and, and so I have made my record part of this campaign. I am happy to answer to any of the decisions that I have. Um, and, and that's what I have done. I've answered them to the Philadelphia Inquirer. I've answered them to the Legal Intelligencer. I answered them to the Bar Association. And I answer them to the voters because ultimately the voters are going to decide who the Supreme Court Justice, next Supreme Court Justice is going to be on that court. And I, my record is relevant. And I'm happy to answer those questions. But, um, you know, I thought political hack was, was Over, beyond the pale. Yeah, uh, agreed. When we come back, we have to go to break. Uh, judge uh, now, uh, 
for a few seconds, but uh, when we come back, speaking of this issue, uh, you managed to find yourself in a front and center cartoon editorial uh, <laughs> caricature uh, attack, if you will, by the Scranton Times today. So I'd like to get back to your record uh, versus what's being alleged about your record. We're here today, I'm sure you uh, remember, with uh, President Judge Kevin Brobson of the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania. Currently, uh, a few days from now, you'll see him on the ballot uh, running for Supreme Court Justice of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I hope you have heard, I'm sure many of you know, and I hope you have heard me emphasize on this show many times, judicial races don't get enough attention. And it's important w when the chips are down and rights are at stake, it's the courts that are the glue that keeps this country and this Commonwealth together. It's an important vote. So I hope you'll take due consideration uh, and review of records in casting it. You're gonna hear more uh, from Judge Bropson when I come back. And again, we'll start with that uh, Scranton Times uh, editorial cartoon. And uh, as he's already made reference to, some of the below the belt uh, uh, from the opposition. Uh, and by opposition, I don't even necessarily mean his opponent, the Democratic nominee. I mean Democratic uh, special interest groups that often sponsor these attack ads. We'll be back after these messages. Every week, Chuck Volpe shares his perspective on Pennsylvania issues in the news and on your mind. From new laws being introduced in Harrisburg and Washington, to government spending and even local controversies, hear how they affect us in Northeast and Central Pennsylvania. Catch Volpe's views every Tuesday on the Fox 56 News, first at 10. Welcome back. Again, we, we are here today with uh, President Judge of the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, uh, Judge Kevin Brobson who is running for Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, and you will find his name on the ballot in a few days when you go to vote. Judge, back to as we, we left, uh, I opened up uh, the paper this morning as I was sitting down to have my breakfast and uh, knew we were I was coming here to tape you for the show. Well, I didn't. the last thing I expected to see on the editorial page was a big cartoon with you in it. So uh, I'd like you, uh, the, the paper was making a point about uh, uh, the, the way your opponent was being viewed and, and it tried to attribute some of that to you, which was, as you've made clear, not the case. Those were other organizations that, that may, have, uh, may be Republican oriented, but you had no involvement in that particular ad that you were criticized for. But having said that, the issues, I think, the bottom line is this. Uh, there are issues of record being tossed around in this campaign. Uh, you're obviously proud of your record and you believe your record qualifies you to be a Supreme Court justice. So talk a little bit about some of those issues, uh, your record, your opponent's record and on things you can talk about. Yeah, sure. I mean, I look, I, I, I have respect for my opponent's record. Uh, she, she served as a common pleas court judge for several years. Uh, she was, she's a current superior court. She's just finishing up her fourth year there. Um, and, and I think she should talk about her record uh, of service of the Commonwealth. But I think we have to have also a fair discussion about both of our records. Um, you know, she at one point in time or multiple points of time and referred to herself as the only trial court judge in the race. The fact of the matter is I'm the only trial court judge in the race and I've been a statewide trial and appellate court judge for nearly 12 years. Um, you know, her references to being the only prosecutor in the case. Well, she hasn't been a prosecutor for about 10 years, but I honor her service in the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. I think that's fine. But the voters deserve to know the records of both candidates. And I think, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I, you know I've, I've done my be level best in this campaign to, pay, to put my record out there for the people of Pennsylvania to see. And on a couple of occasions, you know, you know, we have seen situations where my record has been distorted. Um, but, you know, you get into these statewide campaigns and you understand that that's going to happen. Right. Um, I have made it a personal mission of mine not to attack my opponent personally. Right. I will not do that and I have not done that. Um, but I have talked about my record, and I have talked about her record. Uh, there Just a couple examples. Of yeah, that. so so there's 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 no debates. We haven't had any debates. This has been probably one of the lowest low pro lowest low profile elections yes. in the history of the Supreme Court. Agreed. Um, so you know what I wanted to tell people is. You know, I have a record that I am proud of. I have a record of serving the people of Pennsylvania for nearly 12 years. Uh, I have a record of making decisions as a single judge. I have a record of making decisions as an appellate court judge with three, with two other judges and seven other judges. Uh, and it's certainly something that I'm proud of. Um, again, we made reference to the decision earlier about the elections cases and the gerrymandering cases. All of those things are certainly fair game. I understand that. Um, and I have answered those questions. 
Um, and I expect anyone who wants to run for the highest court in Pennsylvania to be able to be accountable to their record. Too many times, the people in Pennsylvania have expressed to me that they don't like it how elected officials do not, are not accountable for their records. I am accountable for every decision that I issue as a judge, whether it's a single judge or the side I join in a panel decision. Um, I own that. Um, I owe that to the people of Pennsylvania, and I'm proud of my record. Right. What, what would your, you've traveled all 67 counties, and uh, you've heard a lot of feedback from people. What feedback from them makes you think you're the right person to be the Supreme Court justice? I think the feedback is that the, I think the people of Pennsylvania believe that the Supreme Court can be better. I'm not saying it's bad. That's not my job. I have a lot of respect for the justices that are on the Supreme Court. Um, I know them all. Um, but the question is, when you have an opportunity to put someone on the Supreme Court rarely, this seven body, this last voice on what the Constitution of Pennsylvania says, um, it's kind of like with you, if you have, if you're looking for a free agent for a football team, you know, do you go out and find somebody that has the skill set that you already have? Or do you go out and find somebody that's going to make the team better, that's going to bring an additional, uh, additional skill set to the team? Um, so that's what I think the people of Pennsylvania want. We're electing a Supreme Court justice. Who is going to make the court better. Uh, and my record is that. My opponent is a former prosecutor, a current superior court judge. Uh, she's a former common pleas court family court judge. Um, again, that's her record, and I'm fine with that. But you know who's already on the Supreme Court? Former prosecutors, former superior court judges, former common pleas court judges, former family court judges. No one has the record I have of 13 years in private practice, plus 12 years on the Commonwealth Court, a trial and appellate court judge, holding government accountable to the law, protecting the constitutional rights of the people of Pennsylvania. That's my record, and no one on the Supreme Court has that record, so I will bring a new voice and a new perspective to the court, and that's been my campaign. That's a, a, a great answer to actually be able to distinguish yourself. <laughs> I'm impressed on an office for Supreme Court because most people, including a lot of lawyers like myself, thought, well, it's all the same thing. Um, but you've distinguished yourself and you've given, uh, hopefully, voters a reason to consider you uh, for that office. Well, and if you, think about, if you think about all the cases the Supreme Court has issued over the last five or six years, right. many of them have come from my court, have dealt with the issues of my jurisdiction. Um, so I think having someone up there that brings that new perspective will help build that court. Of the various intermediate appellate courts, there's two. There's the Superior Court of Pennsylvania, where I clerked. Uh, I reminded them uh, probably several times, Judge John P. Hester, a, a great man and mentor of mine, and uh, uh, in the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, where you are now the head chief president judge of. So, uh, but the difference in those courts is the Superior Court is the court of first right of appeal on, on all civil and criminal matters, uh, but civil in the sense that all civil matters that don't involve the government. Right. Any civil matter that involves citizens involved with their borough, their city, their county, the sanitation authority, or any other municipal body, uh, all of those decisions involving government, election uh, rulings and, and the like, all of that goes to the Commonwealth Court. And your point, which was even lost on me, so now I know something I didn't know before this interview, uh, that voice currently isn't on the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, uh, the ju a judge that has that type of experience uh, dealing with government-related issues, and I think that's relevant, Judge, especially now, because most of the important decisions, at least the famous ones, the ones that we hear about and read about, are involving the government, in this case, the governor or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and that would have been stuff that was within your jurisdiction. Yeah, correct, and, and so, so the Superior Court does, does tremendous work. It's a very important court. Uh, it, they really are addressing, however, the people that are in front of them. The, the criminal defendants or the family court disputes or the civil disputes. Every decision I issue as a Commonwealth Court judge has an impact across Pennsylvania, whether it's a local land use and zoning matter, whether it's a school district case dealing with student discipline or taxation, uh, whether it's a matter dealing with how we educate our children, how we care for our elderly, how we protect our historic and natural resources. Every case that I have decided has the potential to impact all Pennsylvanians. I could decide a case that comes out of Montgomery County and affect people's rights in Erie. Of course. I understand that. Uh, and that's the kind of record that I bring that my opponent doesn't bring to the, to the race. Again, I honor her service. She has served well. I get that. 
Um, but again, if we're trying to build a better court, then let's put a new voice and a new perspective on the court and build the, make build a better court for all Pennsylvanians. Tell them why and what in your background and your family values also would qualify you for the court, you think? Well, I think, I think principally, as much as I am honored to serve the people of Pennsylvania as the president judge of the Commonwealth Court and to actually be here as a candidate for Supreme Court justice, you know, I'm just a dad. I'm a dad uh, of three kids. Uh, my, my, my oldest is, is her senior year of college at Seton Hill University. My oldest son is a freshman at George W. University in, uh, in Washington, D.C. and a Navy ROTC midshipman. Uh, my youngest is Gabe. He's still at home and uh, haven't seen a lot of Gabe, missed a couple of football games, but I'll make it up to him after the election. But, but you know, God has blessed me with a wonderful wife of 23 years. We have a strong marriage. I'm, I'm suspecting I'm going to owe her some things after this election is over. <laughs> um, but, uh, and to grow up in a family in North, Northeast Central Pennsylvania in Lycoming County uh, to, to, to a father who's a state trooper, a grandfather who's a Philadelphia City police officer, a mom who worked at Little League Baseball, uh, and grandparents who ran a lunch counter at the largest pajama factory in the world at one point. Um, we're a pull them up by the bootstraps kind of family. So the idea that uh, I would uh, you know, eventually become the president judge of one of our statewide appellate courts and be able to sit in front of the people of Pennsylvania and ask for their vote for Supreme Court justice, uh, it's something I never imagined I would be here and I'm so blessed and honored for that. There are issues right now that are being vigorously debated in the legislature about changing the way we elect Supreme Court justices in making districts. Mm -hmm. The reason being uh, that all of our justices pretty much come from Pittsburgh and Philadelphia right now. And I don't have anything against major metropolitan areas, but you mentioned that you're a voice that might be a different voice and in and, and various metro. Let me add one more that you forgot to mention. No one from the hustings of Pennsylvania, from the center part of where dairy farmers and, and folks like that look to the Supreme Court uh, uh, for guidance and, and look to the Supreme Court to establish laws fairly. It's good to get a voice from, from more uh, rural agricultural Pennsylvania, which is a major, major part of the lifeblood of our state, instead of just, you know, coming from the southwest and the southeast. So. I'll, I'll mention that, that, that you had it mentioned. <laughs> well, that's, I, I, hey, I'll take anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important. Well, the reason I'm saying is I've done editorial views on this network, Judge, many of them about I'm a proponent of breaking it into districts. Uh, I mentioned to you off the air, off camera, that I try to change the form of government in Lackawanna County. One of the things I advocated was that we have council districts so that each part of the county, which is different, mm -hmm. uh, has representation. We'll magnify that by a thousand fold talking about about the state. Um, well, I think, look, I think uh, to, to, to build off of what you said, um, you know, I'm not running off of a geographic diversity uh, ballot or, or, or election. That's right. not what I'm offering the people right. of Pennsylvania. Right. But I am offering them my experience. And and look, if, if, if diversity of geography is important to voters, I certainly do bring it to the, to the court. But what I really would love people to just say is, you know, at the end of the day, Judge Robson has served the people of Pennsylvania well for 12 years. Uh, he, he has received the highest rating from the Bar Association. He's respected, uh, I hope, at least my record shows that, uh, and that he will be that new voice, that fresh perspective. And, and yeah, maybe, maybe somebody from the Northeast media market who grew up in this area, maybe, maybe we'll put him on there too for that reason. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, actually, Judge, normally, as I mentioned, we, we save a minute or two for candidates for closing arguments. You've already given it uh, excellently uh, and eloquently stated. So. Best of luck to you on your endeavor Thank in your you. election. Appreciate it. Again, we are here today with uh, President Judge Kevin Brobson, a President Judge of the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, uh, aspiring to be a Supreme Court Justice of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We all know and have found out in the last year and a half how important that court is to our daily lives. So hopefully you'll give due consideration and consider the credentials uh, of Judge Brobson, an, a, a wonderful and excellent jurist and family man. We'll be back next week at 1030.